case of Palestine, the Zionists wanted to replace the Palestinians, want to expel them. They don't want them around at all, serving them or not serving them. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. And I'm Asa Win Stanley. Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. Today, we're delighted to have author, academic, and physician Ghada Karmi back on the show to talk about the 75th anniversary of the beginning of the Nakba and her new book, One State, the Only Democratic Future for Palestine and Israel. Karmi was born in Jerusalem and was among the 800,000 Palestinians who were forcibly expelled from Palestine in 1948. Ghada Karmi's work includes books that have been instrumental in both my and Asa's early political education, In Search of Fatima and Married to Another Man, and her new book, I'm sure, will join those earlier counterparts. Ghada Karmi, welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. Hello. So before we get into new, into your new book, which examines the one state future in Palestine, um, we wanted to talk about the timing. We're up against the 75th uh, year of the beginning of the Nakba, the act committed by Zionists of forced expulsion and ethnic cleansing of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948 when Israel declared itself a state, an act that continues to this day. Uh, can you talk about your experience of the Nakba? What happened to you and your family 75 years ago? Well, um, you have to understand, first of all, that this, what I'm going to say, is um, is my my view of things as a child. Um, um, as a child who also did not understand what was going on, um, uh, all that I knew was that, as from the beginning of 1948, <clears throat> schools were closed. Uh, my school was closed, so I couldn't go to school. Um, I was a primary school at that time, but, um, uh, you know, I, it, 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 everything closed down. Um, increasingly, as the, the months, the early months of 1948 advanced, um, more and more what I would call abnormalities crept into my life. Um, so it's bad enough that we, I didn't go to school, but increasingly we were really restricted from going out at all because there's a good reason for that. Um, Jewish snipers had taken up uh, positions inside uh, empty houses, that is houses whose families had already left, you know, thinking that as you do in time of troubles, that to just to take the children away for safety. Now those houses um, were take well were used by these snipers, and they just took. I mean, they they shot at people walking along the street. So everybody scuttled in, and um, and that it, it for me as a child, it wasn't that I really understood any of this, but I understood that my parents were scared, and that scared me. Uh, I, you know, it was an inchoate fear, um, and and uh, and so it went on, getting more and more abnormal, uh, until April 1948, which is when my parents decided it was had to evacuate us to somewhere safe, while quote things died down, unquote, and. Um, that was it. I never saw um, um, my homeland as it had been again. I've been back, but it's not the same place. So it, it, it's yeah, it's it's a very shocking, very shocking, very traumatic. And I really think that Palestinians should um, face the fact that this was a massive trauma and. Uh, really, it's very difficult to recover from something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, talk a little bit about your house. Um, 
you discovered almost 20 years ago that the New York Times was in or rather on top of your childhood home. Um, you received a call from the Times Bureau Chief, Stephen Erlinger, in 2005. He read your memoir, In Search of Fatima, and invited you to visit your own home. Um, can you talk about that surreal experience and what it says about how Palestinian property and lives have been either erased as villages were raised or up for grabs to foreign settlers and even bureau chiefs of a major news outlet? That's right. And now, in fact, our house had been an, a villa, uh, which is on one floor. There was no other floor. So at some subsequent point, uh, somebody had built an upper an upper story and it became the New York Times Bureau Chief's residence in Jerusalem. What a coincidence. Now, Erlinger um, actually found my email address, don't know how, but he got in touch and he said uh, exactly that. Uh, I think I'm living above your house, um, etc. And would you like to come and visit. Um, so I couldn't possibly have resisted because I really had to see it. So I went and uh, I, if, apart from actually going into the house, the, 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 the thing that really was pretty striking was that he, Erlinger, was at pains to um be nice to me and uh, and and to, to admire you know praise my book and and things like that and uh, and then to tell me that the family is really family living in our house uh, are terribly nice people and they really very understand and they're very happy for you to look round um and i remember t saying to him hang on it, it, you now know what you do know. You've read my memoir. You're now living above my old house, which has different people living in it. Has that changed your view of Israel at all? He looked embarrassed. He tried to change the subject. And uh, in my conversation with him, again and again, I came back to this point. I said to him, you know what happened. Why do you not say, uh, how would it, how is it possible that would, it wouldn't change your view of Israel? You can see, you're here because I'm not here. So doesn't that mean anything? He, he was evasive to the end. Uh, and I did go and look at my house, which was not our house. I mean, it was, it was dead, really. All the soul in it had gone. And um, these people were using it, um, you know, I mean, they were nice enough. I'm, I'm not saying anything else, but it was really a very sad, uncomfortable experience for me. Yeah, it must have been yeah. unbearable. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it, the stories in your book in such a Fatima are so striking and, um, you know, you're left with this immense sense of loss in your memoir, you know, this um, sort of stark facing up to the reality of a Palestine that is gone forever, in a sense, that, you know, even should Palestine be restored at some point in the future, well, let's be optimistic and say when Palestine is restored at some point in the future, it won't be the same Palestine. And you, there's no going back to, there's no going back in time and that Palestine will, you know, in the future would be uh, something different. So, I mean, on that note, let's get into your book, uh, your new book. Uh, this here it is one state, uh, the only democratic future for Palestine, Israel. Um, and it's kind of uh, an extension of an earlier book you wrote, Married to Another Man, on a similar topic. Um, so, and it's not the first book on the one state solution. And uh, our colleague uh, Ali Abul Nema, of course, uh, he wrote a book about 20 years ago. Um, 
And you reference his work and the work of others extensively in your new book. And you write in the introduction, quote, a shared state is the only way this impasse will end, not because it is wanted by either side, but because it is inevitable. It is the contention of this book that the logic of the situation before us must lead to the formation of one democratic state in place of the current ethnocentric apartheid state of Israel. And you add at the end, another quote, Israel was created and maintained against the logic of history and the same historical logic will dictate its inevitable ending. So um, this is all from the introduction. Um, so Rada, tell us a bit more about why you wrote this book and what the current moment can show, show us in terms of this inevitability that you talk about in the introduction. Well, look, my, my primary motivation was uh, knowing that the 75th anniversary of Israel was coming up. Um, I actually wanted to look ahead, to look forward, uh, um, uh, uh, rather than mourn the past. Of course we mourn the past, we always will. But really, it's high time that we used our energies to inquire, discuss, search for the future. Um, and uh, for me, of course, and I think for all Palestinians, the future means the return of Palestine. Now, what are the, how that return will happen, what it will amount to, these are things that need to be addressed. And that was the primary mo motivation for the book. Um, now, when I said uh, that it was inevitable, I really meant that it wasn't wishful thinking, because um, <clears throat> it's it's in you know it's in the um, the logic of the situation that you have an oppressor uh, who who knows no other language except violence and oppression, and you have an oppressed people. And uh, you can get away with this for a, a long time. And you can see Israel's done quite well um, in so many decades where it's uh, been able to commit all kinds of crimes um, and, and get away with it. But it cannot go on forever. That situation does not go on forever. It never has historically. So that's what I meant by inevitable. Because um, the subject people rise up again and again, ineffectively at first, but as time goes on, they get more and more effective. And the oppressor, uh, having no tools other than oppression, will increase their oppression. So that dialectic of uh, even more violence from the oppressor and uh, resistance by the oppressed will eventually lead to a very different and new situation. Um, now, of course, I, I do not suggest that when this happens and there is a sort of chaos, I, I don't think, I, I'm not suggesting that suddenly out of this, there will emerge this state quickly. It won't. It will take, there will be a period of, of bloodshed, of extreme chaos and violence. But then out of this will come the shape of the future state, uh, a state which no way can it be a state for, for one side um, entirely, and certainly not for Jews. Um, and where, you know, Palestinians have to, as I've said in the book, you know, they have to accept, uh, bitter as it is for them, that to live with what was the oppressor yesterday uh, and uh, people who have a racist attitude towards them and feel themselves to be superior, it's very, very difficult to get to people who've suffered so much to say, all right, I will live with you. But there is no alternative. There is a Jewish community living in what was Palestine. And 
what are you going to do with them? You're not going to kill them. You're not going to throw them in the sea. Um, so, you, of course, you have to live together. Uh, and what I suppose what I'm suggesting, which I'm, most reasonable people would, would suggest, is the way you live together will be in a, in a democracy where everybody is represented equally, irrespective of their origin, race, gender, etc. One of the parallels that is often made, of, of course, is South Africa, but... Yeah. Um, uh, and there are, you know, there's certainly similarities. But what do you make of um, the less commonly made parallel of Algeria, where the uh, what what do you think of the similarities there? Do you think do you see any similarities with what happened with with Algeria, in the sense that the French settler colonists were offered citizenship in the liberated Algeria after they won their national liberation struggle, but um, Hardly any of them chose to accept it. They went back to France. Yeah. 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 Actually, it's very interesting that because, you see, I do see a parallel. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, first of all, don't forget that the French have a mother country. They do. And so when um, the Algerians made that very extremely generous offer, uh, they knew that uh, nobody was going to end up stateless. They, they would go back to France or wherever, because they still were French, they were still French. Um, so that's one uh, one difference, let's say, between our situation in, in Israel. But where I see the similarity is that um, an, a, a large number of these French colonists who had been, set, well, the settlers really, uh, uh, decided to go to leave to leave and to go and find their lives elsewhere. You see, their colonial privilege was more important to them. Uh, absolutely. But this is exactly the point of similarity with the situation in Israel, because what you have are um, people who have grown accustomed to enjoying all the advantage, all the advantages of colonialism without the cost. I mean, wonderful. Where else are they going to get that? Now, when the the Arabs, as they call them, um, come along and say, okay, let's live together in equality, it, it's anathema to many of, pe of people like this on the Jewish side. Anathema. They couldn't, they despise Arabs. They look down on them. The idea that they would live with them in equality is absolutely abhorrent. They would leave. That's my point. Um, we, we're not asking for anybody to leave, but that is what would in effect happen. People with dual nationality uh, will try and make their way back to Western countries. Um, and that will leave behind, as I've explained in the book, a population of poor Jews, uh, religious Jews, um, and uh, hardy souls who refuse to accept what's happening but, and, and hang on in the hope that it will change. That's what I think will happen. Uh, the two-state solution, meanwhile, is still paraded about by Western leaders as a way to kick the can down the road, continue the status quo. Um, how can you assess its popularity by civil society at this point in time? And what will it take for this charade to finally be put to rest? Yes, thank you for asking that. That's a very important and interesting question. Um, you see, you have to ask what's really going on when a political solution um, was proposed decades ago and got nowhere on the ground. and But on the contrary, the conditions for its realization have vanished because there's not enough land left, the land is not con to contiguous, um, and so it's, um, even on those grounds alone, it's not doable. Uh, however, uh, as you say, people cling to it, particularly um, Western leaderships, Western politicians, they cling to this for dear life. Um, now, what is that about? Well, 
I think it's about firstly, it, it's it's easier. It's easier for these people rather than confront what they've helped create in the Middle East, a state like Israel, rather than confront that and understand that that has consequences. Um, you see, if you go on talking about two states, then the the aggrieved party, the Palestinians, get something and would be a, a, induced to keep quiet. And Israel can carry on as usual, although in a, in a smaller geographical space, let's say. So that, that's very, very attractive, the idea of that. And that's what actually made it so popular from the beginning, that you could preserve uh, this Zionist state um, and at the same time uh, um, do something for the Palestinians uh, so that they would stop uh, getting together and doing intifadas and all these nasty things. So I think really that's that's what, what it was. However, uh, I, I, you know, I do feel there's something deeper than that because it, it, you have to ask, uh, all right, well, if that's fine for, for the reasons I've just said, you, you, you Western politicians, you wanted, you, you support the two states, so fine. Now I'm demonstrating to you that it cannot physically happen. Just like, you know, you might say, I would like to have a Rolls Royce. And the, the answer comes back after a while. You're dreaming of this. <laughs> and, and the answer comes back. No, not available. They don't make them anymore. And you go on saying, "I'm," but I tell you, I want a, a Rolls Royce. Now, what's that God about? God promised me a Rolls Royce, right? <laughs> <laughs> Never even better, yes. <laughs> but you see, uh, I really think there's something psychological at the bottom of this. Uh, and and I think Palestinians have to wise up because something that is that Westerns Westerners cling to like this, despite the evidence against the evidence, despite the injustice, all that stuff. What I think, and and of course it's a suspicion. I can't prove it. Is that that deep inside a lot of Europeans uh, and 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 Americans is a an abiding sense of guilt about the Jews. Now that's because, of course, the culmination of that was in the Holocaust, but it was before in the historic persecution of Jews. That remains deeply inside a lot of people, and they feel badly about Jews, and they feel that the Jews, the least you can do, is help them to their to live in their state, make sure that they're safe. Uh, I really cannot think of any other than this explanation. You can see that if something, I mean, they're not conscious of this. I'm not suggesting for a moment they're going around thinking this, but that's what I think animates this very strange phenomenon. You talk a, a lot in your book, there's a, there's a really... It, the the longest chapter really is about a kind of history of different plans for Palestine, different plans of um, of what's often called the one state solution. And you also talk about the binational state and how you know I find the section quite interesting where you're talking about some of the early Zionists were talk were wanted to have a binational state within Palestine as a way really of having a foothold for their colonial project really um and something called there's also something called parallel sovereignty um and you're not you write in your book that you're not trying to make a blueprint but could you maybe talk a little bit about the evolution of the one state idea and its history and where where do you think we've got to now mm. well as you say that that chapter was, uh, uh, was I, I felt it was very important for people to understand how these ideas have evolved. Uh, and, and they really have. I would say in the last 20 years, the idea of a, a democratic state, a one person, one vote state, has acquired much more prominence. Um, it's not, unfortunately, it's not taken hold of... Um, 
uh, opinion formers of um, leaderships uh, in the West as it should have done. Uh, and that again, just I refer to my earlier answer about the two states, because of this deep guilt that then if you then if you have a one democratic state, that's the end of Israel, actually. Um, and that, that is something that there is a kind of a, a, a revulsion against. Anyway, despite that, despite that, the discussion um, of the of the one state democratic state um, has increased over the last two twenty years uh, as a number of groups have come into being, trying to make it happen, uh, and uh, increasingly so. Uh, you know, but so really that that's it, that, that I think is what is how it's happened. A uh, binational state does not solve this problem because, well, first of all, the implication that you've got two, the, the idea is that you've got two equivalent nations, uh, as it were, with equivalent rights. Um, and each community or each nation, quote, um, looks after itself uh, and is sort of autonomous uh, uh, with a kind of joint parliament for defense or things like that. Um, it won't work, you see. It's not desirable. I'll tell you why. Because uh, the other, the national, the Israel national state, um, the half of this binational, binationalism, will be Zionist. I mean, you know, there's no escaping from the fact that Zionist, Zionism has to end. It's been... Yeah, and it, by, a binational state would also be sectarian. It would be a sectarian state. And, you know, we see the problems inherent in such an idea in a country like Lebanon, especially. Absolutely. And in fact, when I've, you know, been through, I've, I've, I've described various models of uh, countries that have, have got different communities. In Belgium is a very good example. Uh, it, the, the fact is, if you're lucky, people can tolerate it and can get on. Um, but more often than not, the whole thing breaks down. Now, in the case of Palestine, which has no equivalent, in my view, it has no precedent, it has no equivalent. It's really unique. Uh, we are discovering as we go along. Uh, and we're, you know, searching for a way out of this uh, hideous tra tragedy. Um, so, so in, there's a limit. What I'm trying to say is, there's a limit to how much one can apply uh, other models. Uh, and you quite rightly raised the question of South Africa. And of course, the, one of the most important reasons why uh, the situation in South Africa and in Palestine are fundamentally different. It is that the the South African Afri the Afrikaners, the, the the people who practiced apartheid, they wanted to exploit the blacks, to use them uh, for all kinds of lowly paid um, laboring, etc. All these jobs. In the case of Palestine, the Zionists wanted to replace. The Palestinians want to expel them. They don't want them around at all, serving them or not serving them. So that's a very, very fundamental difference. Uh, liberal Zionists who decry the current outwardly fascistic government in Israel, you know, mourning the loss of in quotations, Israel's soul, which of course has always been a, a deranged fantasy. They say that the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement is worthless, that international solidarity movements are hopeless, and that the only actors who can bring so-called peace and security, of course, for Israel, are international governments and the courts and the powerful elite. What's missing from that equation? And, and how important are Solidarity movements and the boycott movement, and um, you know, people who take direct action to stop Israel's crimes. Well, uh, let me answer the, the last bit of your point. Uh, it's very the BDS movement, um, the solidarity movement for Palestine, 
um, direct action, whichever way people feel that they can express this, is very valuable, is very important for the Palestinians. The problem with the liberal Zionists is that they don't actually, uh, they, whatever they say, they don't care about uh, Palestinians. They they like to appear civilized and humane and, and, you know, we don't want to oppress anybody. But actually, if they thought about who Palestinians are and what they've been through, they could not uh, adhere to the policies of a state which created all of that and which perpetuates it. So whether they're liberal and 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 they appreciate art or something, it is it is really irrelevant for the Palestinians. It's quite useless. Um, and in a way, you know, I have to tell you, liberal Zionists are a menace. They are a menace mm. because yeah. they perpetuate Absolutely. this false pre presentation of Israel as some kind of civilized place, right. mm. um, which, uh, you know, appeals to Western uh, liberal sensibilities, sensibilities, who think, well, these are really nice people, actually, and the state is quite nice, but they, they got a bad government, for example, you know, right. and you hear this a lot. So they are really are a menace. In a way, <laughs> I have to say to you that Smotrich and uh, et al are <laughs> Are a breath of fresh air. They're yeah. more honest. Absolutely. The mask like is in. off. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they're saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. It's incredible. Um what what do you see as the role of the so-called international community in terms of, of the single state inevitability? Um, I'm afraid that the international community, so called has been extremely disappointing where the Palestinians are concerned. Every time Israel commits a crime, and many of these crimes have been massive against uh, an innocent population, the international community is absent. It does nothing. It, it, it doesn't matter what it says. It just doesn't do anything. And... Um, you see, I came to the conclusion that Palestinians, in order to have a future, have to do away with these illusions. There is no international community as far as they're concerned. There is no um, uh, Western government which cares a hang about them. Uh, and therefore, they're on their own. And they've, they've, you know, they've very often relied on international law, on uh, the United Nations, the, the, the various sections of the United Nations. But it's, it's, never, it's never changed anything. Things just go on getting worse. So that's why I, I feel very strongly they have to take matters into their own hands. And if they do, it'll make a real difference. It's the only thing that will. So finally, what are the obstacles to the one state solution? And do you think it can happen within our lifetime? Well, um, uh, if, 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 if one looks at the book, I have talked about one possible route to the one state. And that is through a Palestinian demand for equal rights. Now, if you think about that, that's actually not only important, but would be very effective. Currently, the one territory, the territory between the river and the sea, is one state. Israel rules it. Now, about half of these of the people it rules are Jews, and the other half are Palestinians. So it it is already a population which has a significant split down the middle. Now, I have argued that if the Palestinian half, which is the one without rights, without state, it's stateless, um, without nationality, that half should demand equal rights with the rest of the citizens 
that Israel rules. That, to my mind, that is the first step. It's comprehensible. It's not difficult to. It's not difficult to support. There are precedents for equal rights in Western recent Western history. There's nothing bizarre about a demand like that, and nobody's nobody is attacking anybody. This is not violent. It's asking that if it's making the point that if you Israel or any other power is ruling a people, you cannot do that without giving them any rights whatsoever, which is what's happening. Now, I feel quite strongly that if the Palestinians really set up a, a big campaign demanding equal rights, Israel has to react one way or the other. It, it, it you know, it has to ignore it or it has to... Uh, uh, get more, well, it has to become more repressive, and the whole thing is out in the open. Uh, so I, I really feel it, uh, something like that has to happen. Unfortunately, your question is very good, Esa, because unfortunately, I don't have confidence that uh, Palestinians will want to do this for the reasons we said before. They don't want to live with uh, with these uh, oppressors, they really don't. This is a very big problem. Um, so, so what will happen? Well, as I describe in my book, and as I said earlier, there's a logic to this. It, whatever you might want as Israel, um, a, 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 and whatever the Palestinians might imagine that they, that they can get, it won't happen like this. It will only happen when there has been sufficient um, social unrest um, amongst Palestinians. This is a very powerful weapon because quite a few of them are living inside Israel and the rest are living just literally where it is part of the old Palestine. Port. So they're not far away. I'm, I'm talking about them. I'm not talking about people like me. Uh, they... If they all rose up, as they did in 2021, if you remember, May 2021, very significant, very significant 11 days, in my opinion. They rose up together. This was really very striking. Um, in 1948, in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, in East Jerusalem, and us outside. This is really something. And that's going to happen again. Yeah, it was kind of unprecedented. I mean, it's not completely unprecedented for the whole of Palestine to rise up together, but it, it, I mean, I can't think of a similar moment really since 1936, really, when it was the whole of Palestine unified like that in, in, in the same way. I mean, it, it, yes, during the Second Intifada, there was um, some protests within 1948 territory. Um, and, and they were brutally repressed, you know. Uh, and they were, you know, there was Palestinians in '48 inside present-day Israel who were killed for protesting in solidarity with the Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza. But um, yeah, your final chapter in the book is is on that and the significance of that sort of what some people called the Unity Intifada kind of um, uprising all together, and it broke down really broke down the barriers imposed by Israel in that way. Yep. And I think that's going to happen again and uh, will gain momentum uh, because that's, that is the, the way things work out. Uh, once people have risen and the cause for their, um, uh, for their uprising remains the same or, or actually gets worse, um, they're not all the conditions are there again. And so it will be like that. Now, when you say, will it be in our lifetime? I have to tell you, I really, really want it to happen in our lives. I, I mean, I'll, here's a personal confession. I cannot bear the idea of going to my grave with this horrendous injustice um, thriving and the state of Israel, the apartheid, ethnic cleansing state of Israel, um, you know, prospering. I can't. I can't. Either I'm never going to die, or, or that the the situation will have to change drastically. And but seriously speaking, I I 
do not think it will be very long. I really don't, because situations like this are unstable and um, they will erupt again and again. Um, and each eruption has an effect. Uh, so it's a bit like that, really. Dada Karmi, thank you so much for all of the work that you do. Um, your new book uh, is brilliant and invaluable. It's called One State, the Only Democratic Future for Palestine. Israel will have links to that uh, to, the, to the book and how you can get it um, on the podcast post that accompanies this episode. Chada Karmi, thank you so much. And thanks for being with us again on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.